eight weeks old when you just brought the puppy home, the first thing you need to do is settle the dog in and get it on a routine. Any tips to help the, with the puppy biting? We're trying not to give her anything to chew on, but she will bite our hands and clothes. I don't mind sleeping with them the first night or two. That's it though. After that, we gotta get through that miserable time of them whining in the kennel because I think they smell. They get used to the smell, they get used to my feel and my heartbeat, and my warmth, and I think they go, this guy is all right. This guy, these people are gonna take good care of me, just like my old family. I tell people to put puppies on the leash when they start to have this problem and they go, oh, I mean, I can't do that. I'm not gonna be able to do that forever. No, I hope not. They only earn that freedom as long as the behavior is stronger than the distraction. And if that's not the case, then you realize very quickly, you need to do a better job of forming the habit. Welcome back everybody. This is, I think, podcast 61, isn't it? Yep. So this is gonna be number 61. Um, I've got Lillian on my lap again, so if you uh, uh, have watched a few of the last ones, if you saw the promos for a few of the last ones, um, with the big uh, corona thing going on, we've got uh, homeschooling going on, we're teaching her how to do a podcast. Um, she has been pretty good and fallen asleep um, on my lap quite often, um, but she's gotten a little bit fussy at times, and we tried doing it during a nap once, and she woke up crying. And So we're going to see how this goes. Um, we're, we're recording number 60. We're recording a couple of them today. We're going to do 61 um, and see how she does. And then based on that, I've got an idea. We're going to do our next podcast. I think we're going to try to do it uh, while we are live on Facebook and Instagram. And I've got a subject that we're going to have um, that might be good to have some participation from. I got Lillian being really funny in my lap right now. Um, we might have some participation and input and it's going to be uh, I'm saving some topics because the, uh, the questions that we get it's not surprising I guess but a lot of times the questions that we get are repeated over and over and over again and we put as much content out on subjects as we can I don't know that there's some subjects I don't know if we can put enough content out I, I you know a lot of it is repeated though a lot of so a lot of the answers are going to you're going to go man I've already heard him talk about this I think it's important uh, to not bore you, but I also think it's important to use that as a testament to the idea of repetition and consistency is how important it is. Um, that's habit forming. And so I think it also set, shows that a lot of this dog training stuff that we're doing is relatively simple. It's not like a bazillion variables and a bazillion things that come into play. Instead, it boils down to a lot of very um, simplistic thoughts and ideologies, and but there's a lot of little details that come off of that, just like anything else. So it's not an overly complicated process. Um, if you if you only go to to the surface and you t scratch, you know that deep. Then once you get into it, just like anything else, once you get into something more, more and more and more and deeper and deeper and deeper, that's where the complexities come in and that's where the lots of variables come in and that's where lots of different options and potential directions can go as far as answers and, and specific details. So I'm going to set Lillian down here. We're going to kind of keep an eye on her. She doesn't want to sit in my lap anymore. So um, I'm double dutying right now. Ben is double dutying. She's over playing with the camera right now, the tripod. So we'll see. I think she'll be all right, Ben, but we'll see how. how Monitoring. How, yeah, Ben's going to be there in case she wants to tip it over. Um, you know, she's climbing on top of our dogs that are laying. Taylor's laying there nice and quietly, and she wants to climb on top of her and pet her, and that's fine. So, um, but what we're going to do with the next podcast and I sh maybe I should focus on the first one at hand before I start talking about the next one but the next one we're going to do is we're going to try to go live with it and we'll record it we'll end up posting it here uh, as a regular podcast but we're going to have some we're going to see what the option of having some live interaction does as far as question asking because I think it can take things into different directions and it's a subject they're subjects that I've gotten recently lots of questions on 
<laughs> Those are subjects that I've done a lot of talking on already. So there's already a lot of information that I've tried to put out there on it and people continue to come up with more questions. Some are re very repetitive. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more specific to their, their scenarios and cases and the individual messages that I got. But um, that's the route we're going to go with one on our next podcast. See how that goes. I got a couple other ideas for podcasts that we're going to be trying. Uh, we may be looking at doing a little collaborating on some podcasts. I think it's a real interesting time right now because it seems as though, although there isn't necessarily a lot of free time um, ever in life, this has given us some chances and some opportunities to slow down a little bit, catch our breath a little bit, recognize some of the stuff that's going on around us from a self-awareness standpoint, but also it's going to give us some options to do some things because there's a lot of people in a very similar boat. Um, and so a lot of people working from home, a lot of people doing things where it gives chances to do things that we normally wouldn't be just simply because of schedule. Um, probably real heavily based on the lack of travel that's going on right now. So it's just, it's making things a little bit easier to merge. Um, and we're going to see if we can use that to our advantage and, and make it so that we can create some value for you guys. So here's, uh, I'm going to get right into this question. Um, and I'm looking back and I realize that this gal has sent me multiple questions. Um, and I didn't even look at this before, but, um, and hell, it wasn't that long ago. It was March 5th. I got the first message. It says, I just brought home an eight-week-old puppy. She's been pretty good the first few days. Going potty outside as soon as I take her. Now she's chasing leaves, digging, and not going to the bathroom for a while. Do I put her on a leash? She likes to grab it and pull on the leash like it's a game instead of going to the bathroom. Any advice would be great. Now, at eight weeks, she literally just brought this puppy home. At eight weeks old, I don't think you resort to putting the dog on a lead. First off, the lead really doesn't mean anything. It probably is too much for a little puppy. Eight weeks old, when you just brought the puppy home, the first thing you need to do is settle the dog in and get it on a routine which is what you're trying to do. Um, I'm looking back and I, I answered back on March 6th and I said, I'm gonna read what I replied because maybe my answer is a little different today, but I, I replied, I said, I think I'd be a little more patient if the puppy is just eight weeks old. I don't, that doesn't change. So my thought was immediately, eight weeks old, uh, let's let it settle in a little bit. Um, I, would, I said, I would carry her to the area you want her to do her business in and then give her a chance. Keep in mind that that age, after taking them from their litter mates and dropping them into a whole new world, they've gone through quite a bit. I think I would let her explore if she needs to in order to get more comfortable in the bathroom routine. So I don't know that I would change that answer two weeks, I, I answered that a little over two weeks ago. I don't know that I would change that any any. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense. At eight weeks old, they're little puppies. Uh, I find that if you do a halfway decent job of having them connect with you, develop trust with you, um, start to show some leadership, they will follow because they don't have any interest in being a leader at eight weeks old. They are looking to find someone that will comfort them, especially when you just brought them into this new place. So. I totally agree with that. And at eight weeks old, you can catch them. They're little. You, you can't, a little eight week old puppy shouldn't be able to get away from you. It's two, three steps, pick them up. Um, so she messaged back, said, I appreciate it. I'll be a little more patient with her. Any tips to help the, with the puppy biting? We're trying not to give her anything to chew on, but she will bite our hands and clothes. So again, I don't know what I, I answered back. Um, and my initial thought, I'm not going to look at my answer. My initial thought is, you know what? They'll nip and chew on anything you put in their mouth. Um, the best answer is keep stuff away from their mouth. So holding the puppy. And I just had this question yesterday with somebody uh, that I responded to. I think it was on Instagram. But this question is coming from Facebook. But I had an Instagram that I messaged back yesterday about take just holding the puppy properly makes a difference. When I say holding it, look at our puppy DVD, look at any of our live with Spry. I don't think I did it with Bella Be Good because Bella was too old, it was old enough at the point that I didn't need to do it, but she was like 10 or 12 weeks. But with a seven week old puppy, with an eight week old puppy, if you hold them improperly, they have an opportunity to form bad habits, nipping, chewing, biting. If you hold them properly, there's nothing for them to nip, bite, or chew on. So that alone is a fix. Um, 
So my answer to her was, I think nipping and biting is often a sign of the pup testing. I rarely see them nip or bite at me. Only reason is because I try to make it very clear to them from the start that I'm the strong leader. That comes from all the interaction and clear body language. Have you had a chance to watch any of our training videos? I'd recommend starting out with Puppy and Foundation. Those are filled with a lot of things. I focus on the first 10 to 12 months of training. So my answer back to her was a little bit further down the road. Wasn't so precise and specific to these little puppies because when they are little puppies we do have and we should use that opportunity to hold them i think holding on to a little puppy there's nothing wrong with that i think it shows um a, an ability for them to connect with us i sleep with the puppies the first couple nights um i don't have a problem with that i think it's a bonding thing i think they they look at me all of a sudden from the pack that i took them away from which was their their brothers and their sisters um, in, a, in a real safe spot that they were used to for quite a while. I take them out of that. And so instead of just dropping them into a kennel, I think you can, and I have done it before, um, but it's a little more traumatic. I don't mind sleeping with them the first night or two. That's it though. After that, we gotta get through that miserable time of them whining in the kennel. And we, the sooner you do it, the better. Um, but I don't mind the idea of them sleeping with me for the first few nights because I think they smell. They get used to the smell. They get used to my feel and my heartbeat and my warmth. And I think they go, this guy is all right. This guy, these people are going to take good care of me, just like my old family. So, but I don't, so when they're little, I think you have a lot of opportunities to carry them around, pick them up. I think you should. It eliminates, it speeds the process up. I got to get from point A to point B. The little puppy sometimes takes too long to get there. So pick them up, carry them with me, set them down when I get wherever I'm going. By holding them properly in the meantime, I see so many people pick up puppies and hold them up to their face and then they immediately chew on their hair if, they're, if they've got long hair. They chew on the brims of their hats if they're wearing a hat. They chew on your ears. They nibble on your nose. They'll want to nip and bite at stuff. It becomes fun. We giggle about it. Usually the response that people do is they giggle. Oh, oh isn't that cute? Oh. And that just feeds the fire. That just gets this little puppy more excited. It gets this puppy thinking this is something that these people like. It's not. So instead of correcting them. I'm not going to correct a little puppy for nipping and biting at me when I put him right in my face. That's not their fault. That's my fault. So instead of me saying, no, don't do that. They don't understand what that means. And the last thing I want to do is be negative to a puppy that I just stole from its family and I'm trying to get comfortable in mine. So instead, eliminate the opportunity to fail, set them up for success, hold them away from you, hold, put your hand underneath their chest, put your hand where they can't get at your hand and hold them like a grown up. Hold them in a mature way that doesn't allow them to get in trouble. So that's so that was her first question, second question on March 5th, March 6th, March 7th, and I didn't respond back to her till I got to her on March 11th. So that was leading up to this last message. I got this message on Friday. Uh, Friday would have been, let's see, I'm gonna grab my calendar here. Friday was the 21st. So it had been 10 days since I responded back to her. It had been two weeks since her last message to me. So, and I don't mind this at all. I, I, get, I end up building quite a rapport with people when they message back and forth because I, I learn more about the situation. Um, so now she's got a puppy that went from eight weeks old to 11 weeks old. Again, before I even get into this, I wanna point out the fact that that is a very short period of time. Three weeks ago went by like yesterday. Like, so don't, um, I think a lot of people, I, I had a conversation with a guy on my way back home two days ago um, in the truck. I called him because I just was driving and it was easier for me to drive him than try to message him back through, it was an Instagram or a text message that I had gotten. Um, but it was regarding puppies barking in the kennel and it, the dog was eight weeks old. And I said, when did you get the dog? He said, well, seven weeks. I've had it for six nights. And so I said, put this into perspective. It's been six days. So a lot you, you, we're I think a lot of times we're expecting way too much to happen way too quickly. And I'm going to break the news to anyone and everyone that's out there right now, because I have heard this. I heard a lot of people saying, oh, you got a month off, which I don't know anybody who has a month off. But yes, life has changed for a month significantly. Perhaps we have freed some time up. Yes, I totally agree with that. But I saw this thing where they said, go, go get a puppy. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Are you... 
the last thing you should do is jump in an impulse because of this to go get a puppy. I just think it's an irresponsible thing in general. Uh, I think it's irresponsible to get a puppy without any planning at all uh, in general, not just because of this. But anyway, the, so this, this um, what, what concerned me with it was the idea of, you know, there should be some strategizing, some planning, some in, in, in a month when things go back to normal and you're back to work and you don't have time and, and you realize, oh, that's the reason I didn't have a dog. Well, you're going to potentially really regret it. But so anyway, so this person has this 11 week old puppy. Um, I'm going to read you her question. Hey, I bought your videos and I've been working on a lot of it with Ari. Ari. She is now 11 weeks old. So it's been three weeks since we messaged. Um, place training is going well, and she is steady with her food and hardly any fuss going into her kennel. So look at what has happened in a really short period of time. Um, so that's great. Um, it's not done. I, I think I want to make a point to this. That it's, it's not done. It needs to continue, continue, continue. It takes a lot longer than that to form a habit. But you're on the, you're on the right path there. So... Here's the next thing. I try to always scoop her up when she is done going potty. Find she is good most of the day when I take her outside. About around 5 p.m., she's all wound up. And when I take her outside to go potty, she runs off. Chews on sticks, runs away from me, really struggling with her outside, not listening. She won't even drop the stick for a treat, and I can't get her to come back to me with an exclamation point. So there's there's some emotion here. She listens to the whistle in the house and will come to me, but outside she only wants to chew on sticks. Any advice? Is there a way for me to allow her to release energy during the day? So first off, I think around that 11 to 12 week old range is typically when I see this. And that's why we work so hard from seven to eight weeks old, depending on when you get them, till the, whenever this time comes up, 11 to 12 weeks, whatever it is, could be a little bit longer, could be a little sooner. But typically it's around that 12 week range that we see these puppies develop all of a sudden the confidence, they're physically big enough that we can't catch them. They develop enough tr confidence that they feel pretty bold about leaving us. They want to go and explore. They want to go do other things and hang out with us. When they first start out, they don't want to leave our side. Usually they're right on our heels. You walk around. We use that to our advantage and we work on recall. We work on the idea of following us to while we walk around and peep the whistle in the yard. Um, sounds like you're using a little bit of a whistle. You're using it in the house. That's great. The last three weeks would have been nice to have been peeping that whistle outside. So here's the thing that I see changing. The struggle all of a sudden becomes, I think because the dog hits a certain point of confidence and boldness and realizes this guy is okay, but I, this is more interesting. Just things change in the dog's life. And so the temptations and the distractions become more powerful than you in your training that you've implemented in the last three weeks, which is not surprising. It's completely understandable. So what do you do about it? Well, first off, back up if you could and use those three weeks where I would be doing a lot of that whistle work outside. Sounds like she does it good inside. Well, I think that's for two reasons. You probably have worked on it inside. It sounds like you've worked on it inside. There's a reason why they're gonna get good at something. It's because you work on it with them. So what will you need to do? You'll need to work on it with them outside. But you'll need to take away a lot of the temptations and distractions, which is what inside has done for you. Inside is less distracting. Inside has more control. And you've achieved results in a more controlled environment through repetition and consistency. So what does that tell us we need to do? We need to change locations, replicate the consistency and the, the repetition to continue to form that habit in new areas. So it's practice it in another spot, practice it in another spot, perfect it, practice it in another spot, perfect it, practice it in another spot, perfect it, and you slowly move these locations. Outside is the last place to go because it's the most distracting and you're seeing that. You're running into problems. Now by 11 weeks old, I would hope that we've had a little bit of an opportunity to introduce a lead, introduce a flat collar, a flat nylon collar, where we can now put the puppy on a leash. We can bump the puppy out to the bathroom spot, let it go to the bathroom, heal the puppy back in, bump the puppy back in. Now, that's 
your answer to going in and out to go to the bathroom. Now you've taken away the opportunity for the dog to fail. It's not going to be like this for the rest of its life. I tell people to put puppies on the leash when they start to have this problem and they go, oh, I mean, I can't do that. I'm not going to be able to do that forever. No, I hope not. But for a while there, we do things with dogs until the habits form and the training gets established. And then once behavior adjusts and shapes and informs to how we want it, then we add, then we change it. Then we, then we allow, they earn back a little bit more freedom. But they only earn that freedom as long as the behavior is stronger than the distraction. And if that's not the case, then you realize very quickly you need to do a better job of forming the habit. And so in this situation, yeah, you're going to have to practice outside. You know what I do? I go out on my front porch where I have a railing, a long concrete corridor. It's concrete uh, slab. It's a long corridor with a railing, and I block off the end of it. And now what I've done is I have all the birds, I have all the smells, I have all the outside stuff, but my little dog can't get any get at any of it. But it's right there and it's distracting, but it's not so distracting that they can't get through a training session with me on that concrete. Now the first day is terrible. Second day is a little better, hopefully. Third day is a little better than that. Fourth day might be worse than that. Fifth day might be better. Over a time period of time of practicing consistently and as long as my setups are set up properly it falls on us now to be able to set these drills up so you might block off both ends of the porch and you might go from one end to the other end and call them back and forth with you with a whistle in between we work on a little bit of a sit maybe a little maybe even a little bit of a remote sit that's a transfer of what you've been doing with the food bowl in the kitchen and the steadiness that you've been working on, now you transfer it outside without any food. Maybe you do it with food outside. Maybe you transfer your entire feeding process out onto that porch. So you, there is no like black and white step one, step two, step three. It's get creative, build off of what you've done, extend it to a new location, add a layer of distraction, add a layer of opportunity for the dog to have to struggle with it, master it, perfect it, and then move on to the next thing. Add another layer, add another layer. So in this case, specifically, you've got, you, you've went from, in, in this scenario, you went from A, which was puppy came out, let, put the puppy down, went to the bathroom, picked the puppy up, brought it in, to Z, where dog is too fast for me, dog is too strong for me, dog is too bold for me, dog wants to run away, I take it outside, no control whatsoever and it gets wild and loose. And then it ramps up and I see this all the time where these puppies ramp up, ramp up, ramp up. It usually mirrors our excitement level when we get angry, upset, chase the puppy. I just wrote an article about not ch ever chasing a puppy with something in its mouth. Dog's got the sticks, you're pissed off, you're chasing it with the sticks in its mouth, it goes, this is great, keep away. And now all of a sudden you go to retrieve with a dummy and the puppy goes, this is great, keep away. And you go, how come this dog is doing this? This dog is not a very good retriever. No, you've created a poor retriever because of some of the bad habits that we've put in early on inadvertently, but we, you, have put those in. So we have to look at the end game and realize what the impacts of what we're doing today will have on that. And the end game might be a thousand end games before you get to the real end game. It's all these little pieces and parts of the training process and you need to set up for the next one and so patience 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 especially during this period of time take away some of the freedom set yourself up so that whenever there is an opportunity you get something positive out of it so change your locations practice there change your location practice there the thing that you're struggling with right now is recall so i would focus on recall now the question about burning off energy you're going to start burning off energy and asking to burn off energy and i say yes you can do that as long as it's controlled she's good hon if you want to leave her there you can burn off energy as long as it's controlled don't allow energy burnoff to be free for all. And I'm going to talk about this in the next podcast with an older dog. But I don't allow dogs to just run amok, run crazy, burn off energy, and have that owner go, oh, great, now they're going to tire themselves out. Because you might see it for a blink. But that blink is the dog just being exhausted from being an animal, being wild, being crazy. And what they've done in that time period is they've conditioned themselves to be a stronger, harder running, harder charging, more 
athletic and less controlled dog, you're creating a habit. The habit is run wild. And when you run wild and sprint, you can sprint further tomorrow and you can sprint further the next day and you can sprint even further the next day without getting tired. Because that is what athletic training does. A runner can't run, I can't run five miles today. No way, man, I'd have to stop. I just, I haven't ran in years. But I could probably run, uh, <laughs> Ben's laughing at me right now. I could run a half mile, maybe three quarters of a mile, with, and, 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 and I'd probably just start loosening up and, and feeling like, okay, now I broke free from this lactic acid. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start about to feel, and I'd be so exhausted, I'd have to say, that's it, I'm done. And I'd be sore from that, and I'd be tired from that. And then the next day, I'd go, okay, I'm going to run again. And I'd probably be the same, and I might do that for two or three days. But by the time I get doing that two or three days consistently, I'm not so tired anymore. I'm not sore anymore from running a half mile. And I probably can push past that first half mile, which is always the hardest for me. I push past it, and now I run another half mile. Now I ran a total of a mile. And I'm probably a little sore, but not quite as sore as I was the first day because my body has been conditioned to start realizing that this is what's going to happen in my lungs, in my heart rate and all that stuff. And I'm losing weight at that point. So I'm starting to get into a little bit better shape. And then that allows me to run a little bit further the next week without getting exhausted and tired and sore. And then I get a little bit, I continue to do this and then I run a little bit further and then I run a little bit further. And then if I run a half hour, if I run a half mile three weeks later, I go, I'm not even, that's, that's nothing. I'm not even breathing hard. So I'm not going to exhaust myself by free running and creating myself to become more, unless I continue to run. And eventually you're going to have to run hundreds of miles before you ever get tired. Now, here's what I do think is important. I think it's combining physical activity with mental stimulation. And I'm going to talk more about that in our next podcast with an older dog because I have the exact same question from someone with a much older dog. But with this little puppy, I got news for you. At 11 weeks old, they spend more energy growing than they spend doing anything else. Literally, it takes more energy for a puppy that to grow because they're growing that fast. They get more tired from growing than you can do physically wearing them out. So stop thinking about figuring out ways to create a conditioned athlete and start thinking about ways of challenging them. And I think what you do is work on some remote sits and then recalls. Because the recalls to you, let and I don't say call, don't call them off a sit. Don't put them on sit and call them off a sit because then you're going to get a dog that won't stay steady and you go, I don't know why she won't stay steady. At 11 weeks old, I told her to sit and I called her off of it every single time. Now she wants to break because you trained it in. So put them on remote sit. That's the mental part. Make them think. Might be two, three steps you back away from them. If you can get that, great at that age. Then come back to them and tell them they're good. Then heal them off of that. Allow them to move off. Then let them drift off. You know, in a controlled area, don't be in an area that you can't call them to you. Put it in a controlled spot. Let them drift off. Let them be doing their own thing. You slowly fade away from them. Get 20, 30 yards away from them without them noticing. And then have them look around and go, oh, where is he? And then you go, I'm right here. Beep, 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 beep. And have them come to you. They come running to you and you praise them. You just got recall. You just got a little bit of a burn off of energy physically. And then when they come into you, you don't let them just jump around and be wild, you say, sit, now sit, sit up, and you get them to sit, and they sit, and it's a game now of hurry up, get back to mom, get back to dad, oh, now I gotta be under control, he's gonna make me sit, oh, now he's gonna take two steps back, we're gonna make this a remote sit, and all of a sudden we've combined physical activity and mental, mental requirement for them to think, and we're combining the two things together, and do that for five minutes a day and get a good extra session in. There is your energy release. And watch what happens when you put them in the kennel. They're going to fall asleep. It's 11 weeks old. It's a teeny tiny little puppy. It's exhausted from all that stuff. So if you allow them to run wild from day one, I see this all the time. And people say, my dogs are not like your dogs. My dogs just want to run and be wild. They must be. They have more drive than yours. No, my dogs would have been on the exact same thing if I let them. I don't let them. I don't let them create bad habits. From day one, I t 
tone that natural tendency, which is, it's very unnatural for dogs to be quiet, patient, steady. It's just not in them. Our bred that carry those traits, but it doesn't come out naturally. We form them. We impact that as a trainer. Culturally, you control it from the day you bring them back, whether or not you're going to let them be a free-for-all crazy house or you're going to make it be orderly and conduct business in a, in a way that is really, really going to foster the idea of control. And when I say control, I don't mean iron fist, I'm going to beat you down, little puppy. I mean respect. I mean a dog that respects what we need to get out of them, and we mirror that respect back to them. I respect every one of these little dogs. At times, I need to pick up my authoritarian role as a leader. That's what leaders do. I don't need to scare them. I don't need to use fear tactics. I'm not putting unnecessary pressure on them. We're not going to... I don't really talk about that often, but... I don't use a collar. I don't use shock collars ever, never, ever, ever, ever. You're never going to see me use one. And I get results. I get results that take a long time, but they're permanent. They're not temporary. We're not going to put something into a dog and spin them up and build them up and create this monster and then decide we're going to put a collar on them one day and it'll fix it all. It won't happen. And if it does, it's temporary and it's artificial. It's not, it's not long-term training. So I don't, and it's a different subject, but the, the idea when these dogs are eight to 11, this, this gal's got an eight week old when she messaged me and now 11 week old yesterday that I got the message. This is critical time for you to form habits. And for you guys that are home right now that have six months old that are wild as all hell, and you're going, oh no, you still ha can change it. I call them puppies till they're two years old. They're very formidable. If you've got four months of bad habits, expect four months of reversing it. It's going to take that long. It's your fault, not the dog's. So just, what's the rush? What is your rush? I, I, am, so, I am so set on the idea that life, I just read this in this book. I posted something about it. Life is too short to rush through it. I, I think that's extremely simple. But man, is it accurate. Life is too short to, to rush through it. Why are we in such a rush with these dogs? Slow down. Make stuff stick. You might give up. You might not be doing the exact same thing that the guy on YouTube or Instagram is doing at four months old with his dog. Who cares? I don't. If I was sensitive to the idea of timing with dogs, I'd be ashamed to show you what I show you. Because most of the, you, you, there's plenty of examples out there that you could say, you are doing stuff now that they were doing with a dog at five months old. Good for them. And, and I mean, you know, I, I got Bella, Bella's at 12, Bella's coming up on 12 months. She'll be 12 months next month. I'm doing stuff with her that there's a lot of, a lot of guys out there that would say, I was doing that with my dog at six months. <laughs> cool. Does it bother me? Do, do, you, do you hear a lot of concern in my voice when it comes to where we're at with Bella? I've got none. I'm really happy with where we're at with Bella. Bella Be Good is a series that we have on YouTube. I recommend everybody watch it. Live with Spry, another one. We just started another one uh, inside the workshop. Good, 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 easy content to f watch. The price is right. It's free. Go to our YouTube channel, Dog Bone Hunter. You get what you pay for, maybe. I don't know. But I think it's I think it's valuable. But the reality is, is you're going to see exactly how concerned I am with where we're at at certain times. And don't think I don't think about it. I I it's human nature to com make comparisons. I I I follow other I follow lots of other trainers because I try to pick stuff up. I think you should too. But, and I'm actually, Ben and I are talking about we're maybe going to be doing something with that. But what, what I, I follow them, I don't let it affect me. I think you should follow other people. I think you should see. I think you should understand where other people are at with their dogs. I don't think it should bother you. I don't think you should, you should let it affect you negatively. If anything, positive, sure, that's good. But 
I, w I certainly wouldn't say, oh, I'm ahead of you. Because I, I would be in the same boat that they are and go, I don't give a damn. I really don't care. It doesn't matter. I, I put this, there's a video that we did inside the workshop that I just saw it the other day. That's kind of why I think of it. But I, I and I got it from a guy, Gary V. I, I, I would recommend following Gary V. He swears a lot. So if you don't like swearing, you might not like him. But I like him. I swear a lot myself. But uh, this guy, Gary V., Gary Vaynerchuk, he, he, I stole it from him. He has a thing uh, that he said, it doesn't matter what, you know, it's not verbatim, but it's something to the effect of, it really doesn't matter what the score is at the end of the first quarter. It's at the end of the game. That's when it matters. And so I don't care where your dog is at a, a year, six months, four months, two years. I don't care. In the, I got this, this was really interesting too. I talked with a really good friend of mine, Craig Korf, he's a great trainer, um, uh, just great guy in general, but was talking with him and he was telling me about a guy that he knows in, in Ireland. I think he's in Ireland, maybe Scotland, but he's a trainer there. Um, they import some dogs from him and he, he laughs about it because he comes over here to the States and he says, you know, you, you know, the people over here training these dogs at a year old are way, way further than I am. They're way further advanced. You guys get way more done in a year than I do. But wait till two years. Because at two years, there's not a dog, there's not a dog you guys have over here that is going to run with mine. And, and, and he wasn't saying it in an arrogant way or a cocky way. He was just saying, it takes me a lot longer to get to where I'm going. But when I get there, they're really good. And I think we, I think it's really true. I think I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I don't know that my dogs are that much better than anyone else's at two years old, but I will tell you this. I agree with him that most people are further along at a year with their dogs than I am with mine. But I don't have, there's nobody that two, three, four years old with their dogs that I wouldn't hunt with and say, I have zero concern with my dog not looking good. You know, that, 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 those dogs meet what I'm looking to get out of them. You want to, if you're talking about running a field trial, I don't do field trials. If I train for it, maybe, but I don't train for it. So, um, you know, it's what your, what is your, per, you got to keep in perspective. What is your goal with your dog? How are you going to get there? And then how are you going to get there by all these little micro steps? So got off a little bit uh, of the subject there towards the end, but I do think all that stuff is real valuable uh, and it's important for us to keep it in perspective. All right, we're going to do, uh, Lily went downstairs, so I think we're going to do the next one we're going to do is live um, and see if we get a little bit of value through some interaction. I don't know, it's 11 o'clock and maybe there won't be much following on it, but we're going to do a live podcast and see what kind of it's based on questions and we'll see what kind of interaction we get so that'll be coming up uh this was number 61 we're gonna wrap it thank you guys for supporting us um i got a couple messages someone said you can't rate it on spotify i don't know what even spotify is that's fine if you can't rate it i get it if you can rate it i'd appreciate it if you would if you'd subscribe to it that'd be great we appreciate that if you'd share it with a friend i think right now is a time in our world that we can do I am racking my brain on different ideas, and we're going to probably do some of them, some of these ideas. Um, my, my question right now is, what can we do to help someone else? I think in this state, and it doesn't just mean dog training, it just means in general, in, in, in where we're at right now, out there in the world, we're doing a really weird time. It's like we're in a movie, man. And I really think that we can look at this and go, if it's a good reminder for us. It's a good opportunity for us to say, what can we do to make it better? I saw some people picking up trash yesterday and I went, man, that's awesome. Had some kids out in the ditch picking up trash. I, I know a lot of people do that in the spring. I think it's a great thing. And I thought those kids would be in school otherwise. Now they're out and, I, and a friend of mine, actually, my buddy uh, is a dad of them and they had their little ranger out on the road and they're picking up trash. And I went there, the reason and he said something about, you know, I wonder, you know, I kind of questioned, well, what are we, why are we doing this? And the reason we're doing it is to leave it better than we found it. And I think that's a real valuable thing. And I think we today, I personally am trying to scratch my brain and go, what can we do to make it better right now? And so we need to, make an effort. And so that's part of why inside the 
uh, workshops is going live right now on our YouTube, on Facebook, and we're gonna be posting the short ones on Instagram TV. Uh, can't do it with all of them because some of them are too long, but we're, the short ones we're gonna put onto IGTV as well. Um, so if you would do this, I think this is an opportunity for you to very easily, without a lot of effort, help somebody. Think of someone, I challenge you, think of someone who's got a dog that you think could use some help and share the podcast with them. Find out if they listen to podcasts, if they do share it with them. If they don't, Show them how to use the app that's probably already on their phone already. They might actually get some 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 uh, enjoyment out of it. Not necessarily this. I don't, I don't know if you get enjoyment out of this one, but uh, you get information out of it. But there's a lot of them out there that I think you probably can get some enjoyment out of. I listen to some podcasts that I think are great. Um, some of them are dog. Some of them are not dog related. Um, but I get enjoyment out of them. And I also get information out of them. And I think that's the purpose. So share it with someone if you know someone that you think it might help. And the old pay it forward type thing. Let's 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 make an effort to do a little bit more of it. The, there's never been a better time to do it. Um, so hopefully we're I, that's our objective. And I hope it, we can kind of pass that on as well. So thanks for listening. 61 is done. We're going to be working on 62.